When I open my eyes, it seems as though a world appears. There's this experience of a rich world full of objects and people with colors and shapes, textures I can feel. And also part of my conscious experience right now is the experience of being me, of, of being a self, of being the center of all this ongoing experience. But really it's not that the self is doing the experiencing, the experience of being me and the experience of the world, well, they're all just part of this ongoing flow of conscious perceptions. One of the central questions in researching consciousness is how does the brain build this completely convincing, compelling experience of the world around us from sensory signals? The brain is locked inside this bony vault of a skull. It's dark in there, it's silent. There's no sound, there's no light. The brain is conjuring up our experience of reality by continually making predictions about the causes of the sensory signals that it receives. It's not that it just reads the world out from information coming into the eyes. It's using this information to calibrate and update its predictions about the way the world is. In my research group at Sussex, we bring together many different kinds of experimental angles in trying to uncover the brain basis of consciousness. One of our experiments, for instance, based on the idea that perception is to do with the brain's predictions about sensory signals, well, what we do is we present faces and houses, let's say, to a person, and we make them expect to see faces or houses. And then we can ask, do people see more quickly or more accurately what they expect to see rather than what they don't expect to see? And it turns out that people perceive the expected more quickly and more accurately than the unexpected. You know, we say commonly that, oh, I'll believe it when I see it. But it's really the other way around. I'll see it when I believe it. One of the biggest mysteries for centuries has been how consciousness happens. It's puzzled thinkers for probably thousands of years. How could any explanation in terms of mechanisms, however complicated, explain the redness of red or the sharp pain of jealousy? That's what David Chalmers, a philosopher, has called the hard problem of consciousness. The history of science has repeatedly demonstrated that things that seem beyond explanation become explicable. There's a good historical parallel that I think about a lot, which is how we've come to understand life. It wasn't that long ago that life seemed extremely mysterious and perhaps beyond explanation in terms of physics and chemistry. That's no longer the case, of course. We don't know everything about life, but it's not accompanied by this grand sense of mystery anymore. Now, consciousness is not the same thing as life, but my feeling is that if we stop treating consciousness as one big scary mystery in search of one big eureka moment of a solution and follow the same strategy that biologists followed when understanding life, the hard problem of consciousness may dissolve. We have made a great deal of progress with the availability of brain imaging methods that allow us to look inside the living human brain. We've got a much better handle, for instance, on the neural fingerprints of conscious experiences. What happens in the brain when somebody's conscious, where it happens, why different kinds of brain activity go along with consciousness. So we know, for instance, that not all of the brain is involved in consciousness. For example, the cerebellum, which is this little brain hanging off the back of your head, actually has three quarters of all the neurons in your brain that does not seem to be involved in consciousness at all. One of the projects we've been working on in my group is to develop measures of brain dynamics that track, let's say, the difference between normal wakeful states, when you fall asleep, when you go under anesthesia, and when consciousness changes dramatically, such as in the psychedelic state. One of the measures we've developed is something called brain complexity. And it turns out that by measuring how many different patterns of activity there are in the brain, how diverse its activity is. That provides a good approximation, a good rough measure of how conscious you are. But we can really put a number to how conscious somebody is, and that's, that's a really powerful and useful thing to be able to do. Consciousness is everything. Without consciousness, there's no world, there's no self, there's, there's nothing at all. This is for me where the mystery of consciousness really comes home. It's not just a deep scientific mystery, it's a deeply personal mystery. It's a mystery that matters. And when I was a kid, I think like many kids, there's this moment where you wonder, where was I before I was born? 
And then, quite quickly, what happens when I die? And that leads you to think, well, who am I? You know, what, is, what is this experience of being me? Where does it come from? What does it mean? These are questions that arise at an early age, and I've just been lucky enough to, to hang on to them 